Welcome to our program. Today, we're going to be talking to a priest who's asked many young men to consider the life of the priesthood. But today, he'll be telling us who asked him to consider the life of the priesthood. Please join us for our program as we find out how Father Matthew Lorraine was called to serve. episode of Call to Serve. Today we are joined by Father Matt Lorraine, who was once a vocations director here and now a pastor in the Diocese of Baton Rouge. We're going to ask him a little bit about his vocation story. Welcome, Father Matt. Thank you. Glad to be here. We're going to ask you today to share with us probably a story you shared many times in your vocation work, and that is, how did God call you and how did you come to recognize that you were called to be a priest, that you were called to ministry? My call came through my involvement at the Catholic Student Center at LSU. I was a student uh, in engineering at LSU, enjoying college life very much, and became active at uh, Christ the King Catholic Student Center, attending Mass there on weekends. And then I ended up out of the blue one, one Sunday, one of the students got up to make an announcement at Mass that they were having an awakening retreat coming up the next weekend or so. I don't know why I signed up. I'm not the type of person to really volunteer myself uh, for things like that, but I had never attended a retreat. This one sounded interesting, and so I put my name down, attended the retreat, and it was life-changing. Uh, just fell in love with God, fell deeper in love with the church, and became part of just a, a beautiful community within a community that attended daily mass quite frequently, had little reunions once a week on Thursday evenings, uh, continue to host these retreats. So um, it was a, a process of growing in my faith, experiencing God's love on a deeper level, um, being impressed by the faith of my peers, other college students and their witness. And slowly over time, no thought of a vocation at all, but obviously the ground was being prepared, the seed had been planted. And during my junior year um, from Metairie, I was uh, driving home with a, with a friend from same town and he had also been active at the Catholic Student Center and I forget what we we're talking about but he at one point he said you know I think God might be calling me to be a priest and that's how my call came I don't know where this came from but I found myself saying I think he might be calling me too and I hadn't thought about it until that moment it just I was very close to the priests there on campus but um, no one asked me to consider priesthood. Um, I hadn't heard it in prayer, but when one of my friends said he was thinking about it, all of a sudden that made it a real possibility for me, and it, it just felt right from that moment on. Um, I decided to go ahead and finish my degree since I was a year and a half away, and um, just to have something to fall back on in case this was just a misread of God's uh, plan for me. but. Uh, uh, graduated LSU, entered Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans, and, and never looked back, really. How often it is the case that people never really think about it until it's brought up. I think it's very important for people to hear that, because oftentimes we wonder, well, why aren't young men becoming priests? Why aren't young women becoming nuns? But we never talk about it. Right. And so the thought never crosses their mind. But when you had somebody in your life say, I'm thinking about it, all of a sudden for you... It became real. I want to go back a little bit to the retreat before we skip ahead too far to the seminary. Uh, what happened at the retreat? Uh, you know, you said it was an awakening for you, that there was a powerful moment for you, but you really didn't share with us any of the details. And I realize it's very personal, but what was the difference? You went on this retreat as a guy who at least was nominally involved in the church, but you came out on fire for God. What happened? I mean, how, how does that happen to a young man? Could you share a little bit about what you saw or how you were affected? I'm not sure it was one thing that happened on the retreat. Um, it was just a combination. All the talks were given by college students. Um, with the exception, there was a priest that always came in to give a talk on reconciliation. And then 
the opportunity for confession was available, which was very powerful during the course of the weekend. But it, it sort of went through the whole Paschal mystery, kind of the Ignatian model uh, of, you know, going through the death first, the death of Christ, but then the time in the tomb and then the resurrection. And so they, it was based on the Curcio, Curcio retreat movement where there was, um, it wasn't a silent retreat, but it was a uh, presentation uh, by someone on some aspect of their faith, how they had experienced God in their life. And then we had some small group activities, discussion. There was a trust walk where you kept your eyes closed and someone led you around and you had to trust that they would not uh, lead you into danger and into a, a you know, a, a mud hole or anything like that. Um, there were some games, you know, some fun activities, people just acting a little bit foolish. Um, but just to get you to let down your guard a little bit in order to be able to experience God's presence, especially as mediated um, through your, your friends. And, and, uh, and then after that, um, I say life was changed in, in a sense for the good. Uh, before that, I had always gone to Mass, um, uh, didn't always get anything out of it, but it was a part of my, my routine and um, faith was important to me. Um, but after that, I began to experience more from Mass. Uh, I wasn't going just out of a sense of duty or responsibility. I mean, that would have been enough probably to keep me going, but now I was going because I wanted to be there. I, I had experienced some grace in my life. I wanted to give thanks back to God. Uh, I was more attentive to hear the readings. And, and as I said, I got to know the priest very well, too, on a first-name basis. And so... Um, Attending Mass was very different when you know the celebrant personally. He knows you. You're there with a community of friends. It's a community before you even arrive at church, and then that gets celebrated in the sacrament. So, and then we began to do service projects also. I was a tutor at a children's home here in town. We did food drives. We did uh, all kind of things, um, uh, step by step. It, just, it was a vibrant Catholic culture that until that time I had not experienced. I, I had experienced it in a larger sense, growing up in Metairie is a very Catholic town, but I had attended public schools, and so I wasn't a product of Catholic education to that point, and so it wasn't until I, I really became active at Christ the King that I experienced the best of what Catholic culture can offer, where it's, it's everything from prayer to recreation to study to service, uh, the whole ball of wax. Well, you mentioned that there were several priests that you got to know. Obviously, when a young man is thinking about maybe God's calling me to the priesthood, the priesthood has to look attractive. If the priests around him are not happy or grouchy, that usually passes very quickly, that thought, and, and they move on. Were there any priests in particular? Or did you see anything in particular in these priests that made you say, this could be a very fulfilling life for me? Um, the priests were very accessible. <clears throat> Their offices were right there at the time. This was before they had uh, renovated the student center, so it allowed very little privacy for the priests. I don't know that I personally would have liked it as much now that I'm a priest, but it was wonderful for the students that uh, all their offices were right there, kind of ad adjacent to the common area. And there was a team ministry at the time of Claritian priests, there was a Trinitarian priest, there was a diocesan priest, Father. Pat Mascarello was on the staff then. He was one of those that who was very influential. And uh, there was just a sense of being around them. Um, not that I don't remember specifically times that I would have to go to them, but they were available. If you had a question about the faith, if you needed to see was he available uh, to help out with some type of activity we were, we were planning. Um, and of course, daily mass, they were there as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a sense of seeing both those priests specifically, but priesthood in general as being real men. They weren't um, up on a pedestal. They were held with a great deal of respect and affection, uh, but they were not at the men of mystery that they were growing up that uh, where they were a little bit, uh, they weren't ordinary men in other words. They might have been uh, superhuman in some ways just, just growing up, but uh, here they became ordinary in a sense, okay, I could see myself being like one of them but extraordinary in the sense that they have a very special vocation uh, that they've been called, they've said yes to. Now you mentioned a little bit your hometown. While all of this was going on, what was your family's reaction? Was your family very Catholic and hoping that maybe some vocations would come from the family? Was this a huge surprise? 
what was the sort of reaction you were getting as your life was changing from your family, uh, considering that you did not seem that interested growing up? The family was very Catholic, but not in the sense of, of being heavily involved in the parish. Uh, we weren't involved in any ministries. I wasn't in the youth group. My parents were not uh, Eucharistic ministers, electors, or any of those, but we were faithful Catholics. We attended Mass, uh, went to confession on a regular basis, uh, said, prayed the rosary when traveling in the car. Uh, some of those things that identified us as being faithful Catholics, uh, being nourished by all that. Uh, it's interesting when I told my parents that I was going to be a priest, uh, they were caught off guard. They hadn't really seen it coming, even though they had seen me becoming more active, but they were very supportive. My mother, though, shared something interesting. She came after I told them, I left them alone. She came, found me a little while later in my room and said, you know, when you were just a baby, I had said a prayer that you might be a priest. And then one of those prayers you just say, I think, in gratitude of being a new parent. Uh, I was the second child. Uh, I have an older sister. And then my mother forgot about that prayer for about 20 years. And then all of a sudden I came in and said, and so there, is, there was a seed planted even earlier, uh, in addition to them providing a good example to me and teaching me the faith. There was an openness within the family, even though it wasn't ever expressed to me personally until it was sort of a confirmation once I discovered the vocation and through another route. You know, there are many dangerous mothers in the scripture, <laughs> Hannah and Elizabeth and others, that say to God, God, do whatever you want with this child, and are usually surprised when God actually does a lot with that child, and, and what a powerful prayer that is when mothers and fathers really dedicate their, their children to God. What a difference that can make, even if it doesn't manifest until later on in their lives. So you had, you had mentioned this community that's going on in college and you're finishing your degree. You're starting to do your discernment. You're starting to think about your life ahead. Uh, what sort of things were you doing before you got to the seminary that were helping you in your discernment process so that you could say yes when it was time for you to make that decision? Well, I was still heavily involved in the student center. I asked one of the priests to be a spiritual director to sort of deepen my prayer life. I started meeting with the vocation directors, both down in New Orleans and also in Baton Rouge. I moved into the Catholic Student Center my last semester. Uh, there's always a, a resident student or two to sort of help take care of the things, and I was one of those. Uh, at the time, they were called church mice. Later, they became rats. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the resident students who got free room and board in exchange for locking up and cleaning and handling some of the day-to-day -day activities behind the scenes. So there was a close, there was a sense of drawing closer to the, to the life of a priest and, and helping just in um, small ways, but then also deepening my life of prayer. Continuing to be active in the community to develop my social skills. So I was still going out on dates, uh, not in a sense of looking for a future spouse, but trying to have good relationships with men and women so that I would uh, be, be better prepared to serve God's people. So you're already beginning to learn the liturgical life of the church and service in the church. And so when the idea of what a priest's life is like was presented to you, it wouldn't be that great of a leap to think that that's something that you could do. Exactly. Well, we're going to uh, pause here just for a moment, and we'll be back soon with Father Matt Lorraine to hear a little bit about his seminary trials and some of the obstacles maybe that he faced in his journey to the priesthood. We'll be right back. Make me a better person, more considerate towards others, more honest with myself, more faithful to you. Help me to find my true vocation in life and grant that through it I may find happiness myself and bring happiness to others. Grant, Lord, that those whom you call to enter priesthood or religious life may have the generosity to answer your call so that those who need your help may always find it. 
We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hi, this is Deacon Jody Moscona. Join me for Catholic Life, ordinary people with extraordinary faith. These are your friends, your neighbors, members of your parish, and of course, the shakers and movers of Baton Rouge. That's Catholic Life, ordinary people with extraordinary faith. back to Call to Serve. We're with Father Matt Lorraine and he was telling us a little bit about some amazing experiences he had in college that helped him to really discern his call to the priesthood. And we, we sort of ended with just the time when he was beginning to enter into the seminary. So, you know, it's easy when you're having a good time and socializing, but seminary, this is when the discipline and the difficulties and the studies come along for preparing for the priesthood. So you're entering into the seminary now. How does seminary life fit for you? It was, it was a great fit. Um, I wasn't sure how I would respond. I was in engineering, so all of my classes were math, science-oriented, seminaries, liberal arts. But uh, it, was, it was very beneficial. Um, the philosophy, I did a year of pre-theology. At the time, they didn't require as many philosophy hours, so I had taken... I think six or nine hours of philosophy the summer that I graduated just to get a head start and then moved into the seminary for pre-theology and actually kept an umbilical card stretched between Baton Rouge and New Orleans that I would go back uh, to Baton Rouge quite often on weekends to attend a football game to do some of the things. So I had a support system at my what I consider my home parish at the Catholic Student Center but then soon developed a wonderful support system in the seminary that you, you do form a fraternity, uh, you do become brothers in Christ and uh, really bonded with my classmates from other dioceses as well as my brother seminarians for the Baton Rouge Diocese. Uh, just had a, a great experience each year. I always felt like if it wasn't for me, God would let me know. Um, I would be miserable there, I would be uncomfortable. There would be some sense of discomfort that would tell me I was barking up the wrong tree. My intentions were correct, but maybe I misinterpreted. I'm being, but that never happened. Um, I, I excelled at the seminary and enjoyed the whole life of it. Um, a friend of my, uh, a friend of mine, and we we decided that we would be holistic in our approach to seminary formation. We would give, you know, maybe a third of our attention and time to academics, a third to spiritual development and, and growth and a third to fraternity, to uh, recreation, to uh, enjoying some of the um, different cultural events in the city of New Orleans, some of the athletic events. And so it was, it was a nice sense of balance there. Well, that's good because obviously formation isn't just we want men who are really smart and pass their classes, but who understand life and who've had experiences that, from which they can preach and, and share with others. Usually in a seminarian's life, there comes a time when he knows, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do, and gets excited and really begins to look forward. Do you know when that time was for you? I cannot pinpoint a particular time. It was kind of as we got closer to ordination and closer to making the promise of celibacy, uh, the, the, the candidacy for orders and, and all that. Then it became more serious uh, that, okay, now's the time I've got, I've got a deadline approaching. Um, but there again, it wasn't so much something to be afraid of as something to embrace and to say, okay, this, this is what I've been working for. This is going to uh, be a, a threshold that I step across, but it's also going to help solidify my call, uh, confirm it. Um, and as you mentioned, we were, had been doing some field education, and we had been also uh, active. We're lucky that Baton Rouge is only an hour drive from, from New Orleans, so we were able to come back and participate in confirmation retreats and youth activities and some catechetical experiences. We were able to sort of put our learning into practice as we were going along. 
and there were cer certain priests that you became close to in the seminary, so you would go help out on weekends, and, and there again, there was another chance to sort of see oneself in the role as a priest, even as you were preparing for ordination. Um, so the, there probably wasn't the moment, but there was a maybe a six to 12 month period of, of stepping across the threshold and saying, and then starting, getting, starting to get excited about ordination. At the time also, we did a non-ordained uh, internship that we, we did a six month internship in the parish right before we were ordained deacons, where we were given special faculties to, to preach on Sunday, to get a little experience of offering a reflection on the word. Um, technically, you wouldn't call it the homily today since we were not ordained, but we were allowed to reflect on the scriptures and, and do some, some study and some um, uh, reflection. How, how do these readings apply to daily life? What is God saying to the community? What is God saying to me this particular weekend with these Sunday scripture readings and doing some adult education classes and, and things like that? Now, so far, you've made the whole journey sound really pleasant and really easy. <laughs> but I know that nothing worthwhile comes completely on a silver platter. Were there any obstacles? Were there times when doubts or opposition or where you really began to question? Were there obstacles that stood in your way as you were, as you were making this journey? Sure. Oh, sure. You, you come face to face with your own limitations and your own unrealistic expectations. Uh, you begin to wonder, well, God's going to remove some of these challenges, whether it's uh, a desire for marriage or a desire to be, you know, have children of my own. Uh, but that's part of embracing the vocation. It's, you have to know what you're giving up in order to see what you're choosing. And uh, you begin to experience that great mystery that there's no time that we don't offer something to God that he doesn't fill us. If we, if we can create an empty space in our lives for God, he's going to fill us with what we need. And so it is a, a step of trust in God's providence. Um, you do also go through the feelings of a little bit being unworthy, of still struggling uh, with human imperfection, with sinfulness in your life, and you don't want to be a hypocrite and say, I can't get up on Sunday Mass and celebrate if I'm... But then you, you also say, but it's, it's also a pathway to greater compassion that uh, God, we don't become perfect till we get to heaven, so we have to experience a certain amount of human brokenness, uh, even in the priesthood, so that we can be compassionate uh, uh, confessors and spiritual fathers to our parishioners, and uh, we can't do that from a position of uh, standing on, on, you know, an ivory tower somewhere. No, I, I know what it's like to struggle with prayer. I know what it's like to struggle with doubt. Uh, I know what it's like to continue to to practice one's vocation, even though emotionally I'm not getting anything out of it at this moment. So. Uh, to a large extent, I was protected from some of that in the seminary, but I experienced it after ordination in the priesthood. But it's, it's part of growing in maturity and, and growing in faith and gaining acceptance, and, but more often than not being surprised by God's generosity, uh, even in the midst of uh, any feelings of unworth or um, uh, humility, whatever, whatever. So all that study, all that preparation, you finally get to the time of ordination. You get to step into this vocation. How has that fit for you? Has it been worth it? Have you found what you're looking for in the priesthood? Absolutely. It's been a, it's been a great life. It's had its challenging moments. Uh, uh, it's, the, you know, you go through times of great excitement, times of depression. Uh, you can feel overwhelmed at times. I, I know when I was uh, first made a pastor, that was something of a difficult transition. You're always excited as, as an associate pastor looking forward to that moment when you have your own parish and you'll be able to do things better than what your pastor was able to do uh, and then you go through a little bit of depression and think there's a lot of responsibility on my shoulders I'm not sure I'm able to handle all these questions that are being thrown at me but you you work through it you learn to rely on, on uh, your parishioners your parish leaders uh, you also develop strong relationship with your brother priest, that there's never a moment that there's a question of how to proceed in a certain situation. I can always pick up the phone and get some advice uh, from brother priests who have also encountered similar uh, situations and see how they would handle it and then pray about it and, and you do it to the best of your ability, knowing that you're going to make mistakes uh, as in every profession, but that's how our greatest learning comes about. That's how we gain wisdom and um, 
people are very good, though. They're very, they, uh, they were very patient with me as I learned the ropes of how to best be a pastor and very supportive, and that allows you to, to go on. Well, it's amazing how, how much the, the community really does support their priests, even when we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we, we figure it out along the way and get a lot of support from, from the laity. Um, as we're sort of wrapping up the show, one of our really strong themes on the show, of course, is vocations and really encouraging vocations. If there are young men watching today who may or, maybe are discerning their own call or parents or grandparents watching who have young men who they think would really make very fine priests or ministers in the church, um, do you have any advice in, in, in how to really promote the vocations and help young men to, to realize their calling? Uh, just to say it's, it's a wonderful life. Um, if God calls you to it, it's not one that we would choose of our own, but, um, and yet we do have, participate in the call. Uh, God does not want to make the decision for us, so He leaves enough doubt, enough room to maneuver so that we can really say, no, I feel like God put the call here, but I'm choosing it. I'm choosing to say yes. Um, there are other ways that I could serve God and be happy. This is not the only way, but this is the one that has the strongest pull in my life right now, so that's the one that I wish to follow. And then there's different times to answer that call. You can answer it right after high school. You can answer it after a couple of years of college, maybe after a couple of years even of working uh, in the secular world. So there's different times. My advice is sooner rather than later, though. If the call's there, it's not going to go away. Um, the earlier we answer, the more time we have for God to form us, and of course, the more time we have to serve God as priests. But uh, always make it doesn't hurt if you if you feel like you want to experience college life for a couple of years, where you won't go wrong. You'll you'll be doing what we call remote preparation by developing your social skills, your study habits, your prayer life. That can happen both prior to seminary as well as during seminary. Um, so there's there's a place for everybody, and we. God respects our unique personalities and differences and, uh, and then invites us. And when the time's right, hopefully we, we say yes. Amen. Amen. Well, we thank you for saying yes, both to your vocation and to joining us today and sharing with us your story. We know that it's not easy always to share the personal walk that we've had, but it really can help a lot of other people to be encouraged and inspired in their own walk with the Lord. We want to once again um, just speak to all of those who are watching us today by television. We want to ask you to continue to pray for the priests and the religious and all the full-time ministers in your diocese. We want to continue to ask you for your prayers for us here at the program. And most of all, to pray for young people today, that they might continue to hear the call from God, that they might be able to get past all of the distractions, that they might have a generous heart to say yes, and that they might understand that they too are called to serve.